Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit. Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Take a drive down Jefferson and you may notice that something is missing why the city of Detroit got rid of Christopher Columbus. Barbershops, salons, spas now all have the green light to reopen, but you're going to notice some big changes when you make your way inside. I'll talk you through it coming up in my Help Me Hank report. All right, Hank, but we begin with protesters hitting the road and picketing at the homes of Detroit City Council members. Defender cameras are there to catch it. The protesters are now calling on those council members to vote down the expansion of facial recognition technology in the city. It's been a hot topic along with the backlash against Detroit's green project green light cameras. We bring in defender Sean Lay live at Detroit police headquarters where protesters have been gathering again. Sean, this was uh, far different though from a march through the streets. Absolutely right here where we see protesters night 17 now of protesters gathering here, but we saw three different protests today in Detroit neighborhoods and you're right. They were targeting the homes of Detroit City Council members. But the facial recognition uh, is uh, the thing that you know has proven most controversial and is part of our demands. Uh, it's part of our effort to defund DPD. Protesters taking their message directly to the homes of Detroit Council members. In a couple of minutes, just line up on Cashew. This is the group Detroit will bring. One of the main protest groups who take to the streets on a nightly basis. Today, a bold move going to the homes of Detroit Council members, Janae Ayers, James Tate, and Andre Spivey. Their demand to defund the Detroit Police Department, starting with the elimination of the use of facial recognition technology, technology approved by the Board of Police Commissioners last fall. This group saying its use is racist, doesn't work, and can misidentify people of color. I'm fighting for what I believe is right. I'm trying to get, give a better, like, better life for people. No confrontations with the members themselves. This was a car caravan to deliver their message. These are things that need to be brought to people's attention and things that really need to be stopped. Back here live outside Detroit Police Headquarters in downtown Detroit. Again, night 17 of protesters here. Many just came back from those car caravans. We asked the three council members whose homes were targeted today to comment about uh, what they think of this, what they felt about uh, the protesters outside their homes. We have not heard back from them. I will tell you this, the defenders have learned that tomorrow Detroit City Council is planning on voting on facial recognition technology, more funding for it. That's been taken right off the table. We're live tonight in downtown Detroit. Sean Lay, local four defenders. Uh, uh, Sean, I should note, this isn't the first time we've seen protests go to homes. Just last night in Harper Woods, we've been reporting on an in custody death of a woman there uh, in police custody and protesters went right to the mayor's house, even yeah. putting signs on the home itself. Yeah. All right, Sean. It's been the target of vandals for years and today it's gone. Mayor Duggan ordering the statue of Christopher Columbus be removed from its perch at Jefferson and Randolph and put into storage. We've got brand new video here of it coming down today. Let's get to Mara McDonald who's live downtown with more on why the mayor says he did it, Mara. Hi, Devin. Take a look. You can see Christopher Columbus is no more here. And the mayor says that his reasoning is such that he just doesn't want more drama. Take a look. The city opted to take the statue down, the mayor addressing it at his afternoon briefing. You know, I've been uh, bothered for a while by the fact that the statue is occupying such a place of prominence next to City Hall. Three years ago, Detroit City Council voted to stop recognizing Columbus Day as a holiday. And with the civil unrest around the country and the targeting of statues for vandalism, the mayor says this was a fairly easy decision. When I looked at some of the violence around the country, and in particular, you got people with arms gathering around uh, a Columbus statue in Philadelphia, arguing with people and said, we just don't need this. We should have a conversation as a community as to what is the appropriate uh, place for such a statue. But I don't want to have that conversation uh, in the midst of uh, uh, you know, at gunpoint or in the middle of arguments. So I just had him put it in storage. We'll have a conversation as a community. Uh, but I just don't think, as I felt with Cobo Hall, which I pushed very hard to change, I didn't think that our convention center, a national symbol of the city, should be named after somebody uh, who, who really uh, did a lot uh, to make the lives of African Americans worse in the city of Detroit. Back here alive, that statue had been targeted in the past with graffiti. It had a noose around its neck at one time. 
Word from the mayor is it's getting moved. They'll figure out what to do with it later. We're live downtown tonight. I'm Mara McDonald. Back to you. Yeah, all right, Mara. Well, this has been a very long time in coming for many. Today, hair salons and barber shops are back open for the first time since they shut down back in mid-March. And as you would expect, they were busy not just with cutting hair, but also maintaining a lot of new safety guidelines as well. Consumer investigator Hank Winchester joins us now live with more on what it was like for customers on day one. Hank? Sandra and Devin, good afternoon to both of you. A big day for those of you in need of a haircut, maybe those who were hoping to get a manicure, pedicure, because salons, barbershops, spas now open here in Metro Detroit. Take a look. We're here at Aqua Salon in downtown Royal Oak. No matter where you go, though, around the area, you're likely going to notice some big changes once you go inside. It is a big day for those of us who've been waiting for a much needed haircut. Got a point right away, got what my uh, barber I regularly go to, and uh, you know, it was nice to be back in the atmosphere. Salon, spas, and barber shops like this one, the Hayes Barber Shop in Sterling Heights, now open for business as of today. And employees are working to make sure that you and their own staff remain safe. We can't have anybody inside waiting. Um, everyone has to wear face masks. You have to wear a face shield if you have to take your clients face mask off and do a beard service. We're just being extra diligent as far as wiping down um, the, the front door and things that clients touch more than we were before. Changes you'll notice, face mask required, social distancing encouraged and enforced inside, and you'll likely wait outside until your stylist is ready for you. We do not allow people to really come and wait, you know, so they just come for their appointment time only, We're allowing only two to three people working at the salon. Here at Aqua Salon in Royal Oak, a lot of thought and preparation went into making sure that everyone that makes their way inside remains safe. We're cutting back our number of stylists that are working for time, um, that way we're allowing at least one to two stations in between each working stylist so our clients feel more comfortable and our stylists feel safe as well. Back out here live, if you do have an appointment, good idea to arrive a little bit early, maybe earlier than normal. Here's why. There's different changes, there's different policies at different salons. For example, if you make your way here to Aqua, first thing you're going to do once you make your way inside is get your temperature taken. We're live here tonight in Royal Oak. Hank Winchester, back to you. All right. Thank you, Hank. This morning, Detroit Police Chief James Craig was one of the first people to take advantage of the latest step to reopen the state's economy. Yeah, we've got video of him sitting in the chair, getting his hair cut at Detroit's executive cuts on Joseph Campo near Franklin Street. A landmark ruling today by the U.S. Supreme Court involving a case that started right here in Michigan. That ruling states that LGBT workers are protected under the Civil Rights Act. Priya Mann shows us what makes this ruling historic but also has more on the local case that sparked it. Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, a Trump appointee, wrote the majority opinion, saying an employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. Sex plays a necessary and undisguisable role in the decision, exactly what Title VII forbids, a decision that will now impact every corner of the country. It feels like a whirlwind. I feel very happy, and it really hasn't hit me. But it's a bittersweet victory for the ACLU. Amy Stevens, the transgender woman at the center of this landmark ruling, died last month. She told me that her, one of her wishes before she died was that she would be alive to be able to read the opinion. So I'm so sad that, uh, that she, she can't be here today. In 2013, Stevens was fired from her job at a funeral home in Garden City after she came out as transgender. She sued, saying the Civil Rights Act prevents employment discrimination based on sex. Seven years later, the Supreme Court agreed in a 6-3 decision. It's so gratifying to see that the, the highest court in the land saying that when you just discriminate against somebody because they're gay or because they're transgender. It is because of sex. But John Bursch, the state's former solicitor general and the attorney who represented the funeral home before the Supreme Court disagrees. It takes what used to be a cultural conversation about ideas and turns it into courtroom litigation. It just takes more of our culture wars and puts them in the hands of judges. The ACLU says Amy's determination led to a stunning victory for the LGBTQ movement. It was her courage and her bravery to come forward and say, this isn't right and I wanna do something about it and I wanna make this world a better world for other transgender people. And that was her commitment all the way through this process. Amy's wife Donna says she's grateful for the victory and that Amy's legacy will be that everyone will be treated fairly regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. 
I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. All right, Priya. Vice President Mike Pence set to make a trip to Macomb County this Thursday. He'll be having lunch at Engine House and then participate in a tour of Chartum Gear Company in Sterling Heights. He'll wrap up this trip by delivering remarks at Cassidy Structural Steel. And we'll, of course, cover it for you. We are off and running on a Monday. Let's get out to Ben. Sandra Devin, beautiful conditions today. Tomorrow looks pretty good, too. And then we start to crank up the heat as we head into the weekend. We'll look at some amazing strings of 90 degree days on their way. Just a minute. It was not a great day for Michigan native Paul Whelan in a Russian court. Our goal now is to get Paul home without having to serve that 16 years. Still, he has a lot of support here in Michigan and a lot of diplomats working for him. We'll have the latest. All right, Rob, but first, the FDA makes a key decision about a drug used to treat coronavirus. And it isn't good. That's next.